April 5. Samson removes Gaza's gates. One day, Samson went to the Philistine town of Gaza and spent the night with a prostitute. Word soon spread that Samson was there, so the men of Gaza gathered together and waited all night at the town gates. They kept quiet during the night, saying to themselves, When the light of morning comes, we will kill him. But Samson stayed in bed only until midnight. Then he got up, took hold of the doors of the town gate, including the two posts, and lifted them up, bar and all. He put them on his shoulders and carried them all the way to the top of the hill across from Hebron. Samson and Delilah. Some time later, Samson fell in love with a woman named Delilah, who lived in the valley of Sorek. The rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, Entice Samson to tell you what makes him so strong and how he can be overpowered and tied up securely. Then each of us will give you eleven hundred pieces of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, Please tell me what makes you so strong and what it would take to tie you up securely. Samson replied, If I were tied up with seven new bowstrings that have not yet been dried, I would become as weak as anyone else. So the Philistine rulers brought Delilah seven new bowstrings, and she tied Samson up with them. She had hidden some men in one of the inner rooms of her house, and she cried out, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. But Samson snapped the bowstrings as a piece of string snaps when it is burned by a fire. So the secret of his strength was not discovered. Afterward, Delilah said to him, You've been making fun of me and telling me lies. Now please tell me how you can be tied up securely. Samson replied, If I were tied up with brand new ropes that had never been used, I would become as weak as anyone else. So Delilah took new ropes and tied him up with them. The men were hiding in the inner room as before. And again, Delilah cried out, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. But again, Samson snapped the ropes from his arms as if they were thread. Then Delilah said, You've been making fun of me and telling me lies. Now tell me how you can be tied up securely. Samson replied, If you were to weave the seven braids of my hair into the fabric on your loom and tighten it with the loom shuttle, I would become as weak as anyone else. So, while he slept, Delilah wove the seven braids of his hair into the fabric. Then she tightened it with the loom shuttle. Again she cried out, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. But Samson woke up, pulled back the loom shuttle, and yanked his hair away from the loom and the fabric. Then Delilah pouted, How can you tell me I love you when you don't share your secrets with me? You've made fun of me three times now, and you still haven't told me what makes you so strong. She tormented him with her nagging day after day, until he was sick to death of it. Finally, Samson shared his secret with her. My hair has never been cut, he confessed, for I was dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as anyone else. Delilah realized he had finally told her the truth, so she sent for the Philistine rulers. Come back one more time, she said, for he has finally told me his secret. So the Philistine rulers returned with the money in their hands. Delilah lulled Samson to sleep with his head in her lap, and then she called in a man to shave off the seven locks of his hair. In this way she began to bring him down, and his strength left him. Then she cried out, Samson, the Philistines have come to capture you. When he woke up, he thought, I will do as before and shake myself free but he didn't realize the Lord had left him. So the Philistines captured him and gouged out his eyes. They took him to Gaza, where he was bound with bronze chains and forced to grind grain in the prison. But before long, his hair began to grow back. Samson's Final Victory The Philistine rulers held a great festival, offering sacrifices and praising their god Dagon. They said, Our God has given us victory over our enemy Samson. When the people saw him, they praised their God, saying, Our God has delivered our enemy to us. The one who killed so many of us is now in our power. Half drunk by now, the people demanded, Bring out Samson so he can amuse us. So he was brought from the prison to amuse them, and they had him stand between the pillars supporting the roof. Samson said to the young servant who was leading him by the hand, Place my hands against the pillars that hold up the temple. I want to rest against them. 
Now the temple was completely filled with people. All the Philistine rulers were there, and there were about 3,000 men and women on the roof who were watching as Samson amused them. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me again. O God, please strengthen me just one more time. With one blow, let me pay back the Philistines for the loss of my two eyes. Then Samson put his hands on the two center pillars that held up the temple. Pushing against them with both hands, he prayed, Let me die with the Philistines. And the temple crashed down on the Philistine rulers and all the people. So he killed more people when he died than he had during his entire lifetime. Later, his brothers and other relatives went down to get his body. They took him back home and buried him between Zorah and Eshtael, where his father Minoah was buried. Samson had judged Israel for twenty years. Micah's Idols There was a man named Micah who lived in the hill country of Ephraim. One day he said to his mother, I heard you place a curse on the person who stole eleven hundred pieces of silver from you. Well, I have the money. I was the one who took it. The Lord bless you for admitting it, his mother replied. He returned the money to her, and she said, I now dedicate these silver coins to the Lord. In honor of my son, I will have an image carved and an idol cast. So when he returned the money to his mother, she took two hundred silver coins and gave them to a silversmith, who made them into an image and an idol. And these were placed in Micah's house. Micah set up a shrine for the idol, and he made a sacred ephod and some household idols. Then he installed one of his sons as his personal priest. In those days, Israel had no king. All the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. One day, a young Levite who had been living in Bethlehem in Judah arrived in that area. He had left Bethlehem in search of another place to live, and as he traveled, he came to the hill country of Ephraim. He happened to stop at Micah's house as he was traveling through. Where are you from? Micah asked him. He replied, I am a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah, and I am looking for a place to live. Stay here with me, Micah said, and you can be a father and priest to me. I will give you ten pieces of silver a year, plus a change of clothes and your food. The Levite agreed to this, and the young man became like one of Micah's sons. So Micah installed the Levite as his personal priest, and he lived in Micah's house. I know the Lord will bless me now, Micah said, because I have a Levite serving as my priest. Idolatry in the tribe of Dan Now in those days Israel had no king, and the tribe of Dan was trying to find a place where they could settle, for they had not yet moved into the land assigned to them when the land was divided among the tribes of Israel. So the men of Dan chose from their clans five capable warriors from the towns of Zorah and Eshtael to scout out a land for them to settle in. When these warriors arrived in the hill country of Ephraim, they came to Micah's house and spent the night there. While at Micah's house, they recognized the young Levite's accent. So they went over and asked him, Who brought you here? And what are you doing in this place? Why are you here? He told them about his agreement with Micah and that he had been hired as Micah's personal priest. Then they said, Ask God whether or not our journey will be successful. Go in peace, the priest replied, for the Lord is watching over your journey. So the five men went on to the town of Laish, where they noticed the people living carefree lives, like the Sidonians. They were peaceful and secure. The people were also wealthy because their land was very fertile, and they lived a great distance from Sidon and had no allies nearby. When the men returned to Zoar and Eshtel, their relatives asked them, What did you find? The men replied, Come on, let's attack them. We have seen the land, and it is very good. What are you waiting for? Don't hesitate to go and take possession of it. When you get there, you will find the people living carefree lives. God has given us a spacious and fertile land lacking in nothing. So six hundred men from the tribe of Dan, armed with weapons of war, set out from Zorah and Eshtel. They camped at a place west of Kiriath-Jerim in Judah, which is called Mahanadan, to this day. Then they went on from there into the hill country of Ephraim and came to the house of Micah. The five men who had scouted out the land around Laish explained to the others, These buildings contain a sacred ephod as well as some household idols, a carved image, and a cast idol. What do you think you should do? 
Then the five men turned off the road and went over to Micah's house, where the young Levite lived, and greeted him kindly. As the six hundred armed warriors from the tribe of Dan stood at the entrance of the gate, the five scouts entered the shrine and removed the carved image, the sacred ephod, the household idols, and the cast idol. Meanwhile, the priest was standing at the gate with the six hundred armed warriors. When the priest saw the men carrying all the sacred objects out of Micah's shrine, he said, What are you doing? Be quiet and come with us, they said. Be a father and priest to all of us. Isn't it better to be a priest for an entire tribe and clan of Israel than for the household of just one man? The young priest was quite happy to go with them, so he took along the sacred ephod, the household idols, and the carved image. They turned and started on their way again, placing their children, livestock, and possessions in front of them. When the people from the tribe of Dan were quite a distance from Micah's house, the people who lived near Micah came chasing after them. They were shouting as they caught up with them. The men of Dan turned around and said to Micah, What's the matter? Why have you called these men together and chased after us like this? What do you mean, what's the matter? Micah replied. You've taken away all the gods I have made and my priest, and I have nothing left. The men of Dan said, Watch what you say. There are some short-tempered men around here who might get angry and kill you and your family. So the men of Dan continued on their way. When Micah saw that there were too many of them for him to attack, he turned around and went home. Then, with Micah's idols and his priest, the men of Dan came to the town of Laish, whose people were peaceful and secure. They attacked with swords and burned the town to the ground. There was no one to rescue the people, for they lived a great distance from Sidon and had no allies nearby. This happened in the valley near Beth Rehob. Then the people of the tribe of Dan rebuilt the town and lived there. They renamed the town Dan after their ancestor Israel's son, but it had originally been called Laish. Then they set up the carved image, and they appointed Jonathan, son of Gershom, son of Moses, as their priest. This family continued as priests for the tribe of Dan until the exile. So Micah's carved image was worshipped by the tribe of Dan as long as the tabernacle of God remained at Shiloh.